Myron Madden. Dr. Myron Madden. Reverend Dr. Byron Madden wore a lot of hats. He was a very bright individual. He had earned doctorates in Old Testament theology and in Shakespearean studies, and he could quote them both equally. He was the head chaplain at Southern Baptist Hospital in New Orleans. He was Southern Baptist, and he wrote a spiritual and Landers type column for the Southern Baptist Monthly Magazine. And he was so popular because of that, that people would fly into New Orleans from all over the United States for an hour with him as the counselor. But for me, he was Myron. He was Myron because he was my teacher. He was my mentor when I was training to be a chaplain. Myron spoke to me and my peers one Monday morning about his experience that weekend. He had been on call at the hospital in New Orleans that weekend. And he got a call from a family that said, our father wants to see the chaplain. And so he went to the room, and it was filled with people gathered around the bed of a man who visibly was dying. And the first thing Myron did is he said, please leave and let me have private time with his wife. And they left. He closed the door, and he began to talk to the man. The man could barely muster the energy to speak. But Myron spoke to him and asked him questions. Myron said to him, you wanted to see me? He shook his head, yes. Did you want to see me because you know you're not going to live much longer? The man shook his head, yes. Did you want to see me because you know you're not going to live much longer? And you're not sure whether you're ready to die and face your Lord? And the man shook his head yes. And then Byron did something that as a young, young student chaplain, oh, I was finished with the seminary, but I was still young. And then Byron did something that just startled me because at that point, my nature wants to rush to this man's side and say, okay, let me tell you the good news. I didn't do that. He said, I understand that you're concerned. Let me go through the commandments. And I want you to tell me whether you have kept these commandments in their entirety. One by one, he went through all ten commandments with this man. And one by one, the man, the man shook his head. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. And when he had gone through all ten commandments, Byron said to him, "Well, you broke him off. <laughs> what are you going to do about it?" And in desperation, the man lifted his arms as if to say, what can I do? What can I do? Now, I'm going to come back to that story, OK? Remind me if I don't, OK? But I want to shift for a moment to, to a familiar story. People were bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the disciples to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. 
Now, you've heard that passage, and there's parallel passages and instances in, in the other Gospels as well. It's a, it's a story of Jesus saying, this is the example. Why would he say that? Is it because they're cute? Probably not. Because that cute, loving child also can scream its head off, and they're just not quite so cute. And is it because they are sinless? Well, we know better. We know better. When I would work with families who were ready to baptize their child, I would say to them, I said, it's a hard word to see because your baby looks so beautiful, so innocent. It's a hard word to say your child was born with an inherited condition called sin, called sin. And I said, if you're uncertain about that, wait until they are all oh, 18 months old, maybe. And all of a sudden, they're sitting next to another child of the same age, and they don't want to share. In fact, they not only don't want to share, they're ready to do whatever it takes to take in the whole bunch of toys that are there. And ask yourself, I say to parents, did you teach little Johnny not to share? And they'll say, of course not. Well, where did that come from then? It came from within. And I make the same example with not telling the truth. I didn't do it. He did it. Did you teach your child not to tell the truth? Of course you didn't. Where did it come from? It came from the window. So it's not because they're cute that Jesus says this. You must become like a child. It's not because they are sinless that Jesus says this. Instead, it's the stark reality. Remember in this, in this reading from Luke that I just read, Jesus they're identified as babies. Let these little children, let these babies come to me and forbid them not. If you do not become like a child, you can't enter. You see, the reality is that a child brings nothing. They cannot survive on their own. They cannot. They have to have the blessings of parents and extended family and the community to survive. On their own, they will die. And that's what Jesus is saying when he says, unless you become like a child, a child who has nothing and needs everything. Would you say that with me? Who has nothing and needs everything. Let me go back to my own man. We left him with the man with the little energy that he had, raising his arms in despair and saying, what can I do? He's dying. He can't undo a lifetime of breaking God's commandments. And finally, <laughs> finally, I wanted to be there long before, but I knew what he was doing. Finally, my friend said, you're right. You can't do anything, but God can, and God has. He's provided for people who would break the commandments like you and like me. He provided for people who have nothing and need everything through Jesus. Jesus, you can't do it. He has done it for you. And that was the good news he left with that man on the day he died. That God had provided for him a broken sinner. And that's the message for us, too, when we think about grace alone. Because we, like little children, have nothing and need everything. Just like that dying man. Had nothing he couldn't undo. He needed everything, and God had provided for that for Jesus. The great hymn, the great hymn says, and you know it well, 
Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. That's grace. Grace alone. So there is that cross. When Jesus died on the cross, to which we cling, did he die for some sins? Most sins? Did he die for some people? Most people? Oh, that's an objective fact. You can't screw that up. He died for the sins of every person in the world. Now the question becomes, who gets the forgiveness? Is everybody going to be saved? Jesus talked about that at length. Who gets to be saved? None of us deserve it. All we can do is go like that and say, I can't undo what I've done. In, in the church of Luther's day, they said, well, you got to qualify. To get the forgiveness that Jesus won on the cross, you got to qualify. You were all saved by grace. There it is right in the center, but you have to add to grace uh, praying to the saints and venerating their relics. And you've got to go on pilgrimages to where they used to live. And you've got to do your penance, confess your sins to the priest and do whatever he tells you to do. Because if you don't, and you, you've got to do this and you got to you got to go to the mass because every time you go to mass, like we just went to Holy Communion, you earn some grace from God. Earn grace? The heck is that? That's a total oxymoron, a total contradiction in terms. And then it got so bad as, well, you have to earn forgiveness by an indulgence. Originally, indulgence is what you did to earn God's forgiveness. And then it got so bad, they said, well, if you're, if you're too old or too weak or too sick uh, to go on uh, a crusade to fight for the faith or do this, you can pay for somebody else to go. And so you can buy your indulgence. And so after a while, with all this other stuff going in, you couldn't even see the grace there anymore. It was all camouflaged. Not that the church didn't have the understanding of grace, but it was so buried under the expectations of what you needed to do. Everybody who's baptized is going to go to heaven, right? I wish that were true. Everybody who goes to Holy Communion is going to heaven, right? Because Jesus died on the cross for everybody and there's forgiveness for everybody since everybody's going to heaven, right? You know, the, the Christian faith has this wonderful balance between pure objectivity. This is what God has done to save you. You can't screw it up. It's done. But it ain't going to help you unless you believe it. You hear his promise and you say, thank you, God. That's exactly what I need. I believe that. That's sola fide. By faith alone. Everybody needs faith to live. Tell me you're not having faith when you buy a ticket, step onto this flying contraption, you strap yourself in, and there's some guy up front. You never know him. You never met him. You have no idea who this guy or gal is, and yet you bought your ticket, and you're ready to sit back, and he's going to take you, she's going to take you to wherever you're going, because they know how to fly the plane, right? Boy, tell me about faith. Yeah. <laughs> Good gracious you got to have faith to live. Everybody ought to understand what faith is. But when it comes, pilots can make mistakes. God never makes a mistake. Saving faith means you know God's promises. Made in your holy baptism. You're part of my family. It's not going to help you unless you believe it. This is my body. This is my blood. It's not going to help you if you don't believe it. Jesus died on the cross for you, for you, for you, for, for all of us. I'm going to help you if you don't believe it. God doesn't take his grace and shove it down your throat. He wins. 
We're saved by God's grace alone. Grace means we don't deserve it. Well, how do I get it? Trust him. That's faith alone. Did you get that wrong? Where does all this stuff come from? Scripture alone. When Luther came up with, he really wasn't coming up with anything. He was rediscovering what had always been there. And when he started saying, this is what I believe, teach, and confess, because that's what the scriptures say, the church was very quick to say, oh, but then you disagree with this pope, with this council, with this church uh, father. And Luther said, yeah, I know that. Except if you consult that pope, that church council, these church fathers, they're going to say I'm right. So what are we going to have? Dueling popes? Dueling church councils? Dueling church fathers. Otherwise, you're left with, I don't know who to believe. Well, believe God. Absolutely central to the Reformation was sola scriptura. We are going to believe, teach, and confess what is in scripture. Because God won't lie. And God won't contradict himself. That's what it's about. So Jesus told a story about a poor man who was lying outside rich man's gate. And he was so sick, so poor, so it was deplorable, his condition. And everybody ignored him, including the rich man. He's right there. Can't you see this guy? He needs your help. He ignored him. He was too busy living the high life. Well, the day came to beggar died. <laughs> Same day the rich man died. And, and the beggar was taken to heaven, and the rich man was in hell. And he looked up in the story of Jesus. He looked up to heaven, and he saw Lazarus, the poor man, in, in Abraham's bosom. It's his way of talking about it. he's in heaven. He's with God. And all of a sudden, he became very magnanimous. He said, oh, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in cold water to cool my tongue. I'm in agony in this fire. And uh, Father Abraham said, uh, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't help. Because if he won't believe Moses and the prophets, that's what we heard about in, in uh, Romans 3. The law and the prophets bear witness to God's plan for our salvation. Already the Old Testament's filled with God's gospel. It's not like the Old Testament's law and the New Testament's gospel. No, there's one gospel of both. It's all there. They need to read Moses and the prophets. Because he said, well, if, if Lazarus can't come and, and help me, can he send him to my brothers? Surely if somebody comes back from the dead, they will believe them. And, and Father Abraham said, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe them even if somebody should come back from the dead. Now, as a kid, I read that, I was going, hey, remember Scrooge? Yeah. Come on. When the ghosts of Christmas past, President of it, when the ghosts of Jacob Marley showed up, he changed, bam, like that. And I said, well, surely those brothers, those five brothers, would change too. You know, there was a real man named Lazarus, brother of Mary and Martha, a good friend of Jesus, who died, who was dead, 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 because he was in the grave already four days. And when Jesus showed up, he said, roll the stone away. And they said, oh, no, 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 you're going to embarrass yourself. He's, by now, he's stinking. He and James are very embarrassed. He said, roll the stone away. And Lazarus, come on out. He came out. Now, as a little boy, I read that. I said, surely everybody then said, we're wrong about Jesus. He is the Messiah, the Son of God. The Bible goes on, the story goes on, John says, those who hated Jesus went and took counsel how to kill him. So even though a real man from the dead, who everybody knew and agreed was dead, came back from the dead, that didn't change a thing. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of my father, but he who does the kingdom of my father who is in heaven. And what is God's will? That you believe in the one who is in saved by God's grace, faith, and 
know all about it from God's word. Will you trust God's word? Not only in the book, but the word made flesh, came, died for you, rose for you, and lives for you. Someday we'll welcome you home. Will you trust me? That all sounds rather complicated, doesn't it? Sola gratia, sola fide, sola scriptura. Jesus loves me. That's sola gratia. This I know, not just here, here. That's sola fide. And if you know those words, thank God for the Reformation. Amen. 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 Right. Ready for prayer? Father, we lift up Pastor Abby and the council and the staff and the volunteers here in this church. Lord, we pray that you would help them, lead them, guide them, bless them. Give them a short hope that is in them. Pray for our church and our guests that our worship in word, song, and sacraments. Be carried with us all week long. Oh Lord, how wonderful that is. We pray for the Christian church as a whole, that it would stand strong and united in the preaching and the teaching of the pure and simple gospel of Christ. Jesus, Lord, there is nothing else. There's only you. We thank you, Lord. We give you thanks. For those on our prayer list, that God would meet their needs, and there are a lot of needs there. We pray for their health, for healing, for financial cares, so many other things, Lord, that keep weighing us down and paying us. Lord, you cut through all that. You don't necessarily let them know that you're there with us in it. Thank you. We pray for our nation, state, and local government officials, that they would come to know Christ personally and to place Christ's teachings at the center of all their affairs. <sighs> That's not exactly what's going on, but we do pray for you. We will persevere in prayer, remembering that you have asked us to stand against evil and to pray for the evildoers, realizing, Lord, that they know better. We are all sinners. We all need your forgiveness. Thank you. For those who use our building, Dave School Food, I 9, Love Fusion, Redeemer Fellowship Church, Recovery Groups, Exercise Groups, and Hope Members. Lord, we pray that our witness will be strong for these people. We also pray, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would continue to bless them. And thank you, Lord. Everybody who uses this word. And Lord, we have some prayer requests. Jonathan, did anything come in? Okay. We have a praise blessing from Don Wilson. Uh, the double chemo has some serious side effects, but Carol shared that he got better later on in the day. So thank you for that. Um, Pastor Dennis is still having symptoms of his pneumonia. But he's feeling better every day, and he expects to see it all next Sunday. So thank you, Lord, for your healing grace. But we pray for Ron and lift him up, Lord. We ask you to heal this problem he keeps having. We pray that there would be a final solution to it, that the doctors would have this, your grace would be upon him. And Lord, we pray for the Supreme Court. They are now hearing arguments, hearing briefs, I should say. Concerning the Texas abortion law, 
and the arguments are going to start up tomorrow. We pray that your wisdom, your love, your will be great by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Thank you and praise be to you and Amen. Would you stand as we pray together in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I see them and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 I understand we have a time of fellowship. Um, we will